So, <clears throat> I'm sorry for the delay in starting. As I said, I had a go at uh, testing all this setup, and everything worked half an hour ago, and it didn't now. So, there you go. That's computers for you. Uh, so, um, welcome to this session. Thank you for, um, for coming along. I'm going to um, wander around quite a bit, I hope. That's why I've got uh, an unwired microphone now. And it would really help me if you would ask questions as we go along, because it'll um, help me make me feel you're listening. So I'm, I'm going to take the, uh, the, uh, um, work on the belief that at least some of you are here out of curiosity. That is, you're not already um, uh, dyed-in-the-wool Haskell hackers, or at least, uh, uh, and, and indeed, you may be uh, wildly skeptical about Haskell. That's fine. So, so you're, you're, you're the people I'm addressing. So my goal is to say nothing that an ordinarily competent um, programmer would not understand. So this is not going to be programming 101 for people who have never written programs, right? This is for, for you lot who are uh, somewhat professional programmers. But I really don't want to say things that don't make sense because you don't understand the syntax or because I'm using some word you don't understand because I come from a sort of geeky functional programming world. So it would really help me if I do, if you just, if you wave an arm, don't assume that, I, I, that, that, that everyone else knows because probably they don't either. I'm going to use you as my sort of regulating, regu regulating mechanism to decide how fast we can, we can chug along. Okay, so here is the um, a URL which by now uh, should contain the actual slides uh, for the talk. So this is the, this, the thing, the document you have with you is the slides as of Friday, but needless to say, I've done lots of stuff since then. So the slides you'll see today are not the same as the ones uh, that are in front of you. And if you want, you can get them from this URL if, um, uh, if um, uh, D, uh, V, has done her, done, done her work and it's made it past the mirror servers and so forth. This long URL is in the, um, the overall conference program if, you, uh, if I go past it and you haven't got it down. I'll leave it up just for a moment. So who here, just to, um, just to get me back, has, uh, uh, has ever written a Haskell program of any kind before? Okay, that's good. Uh, so no, ma no matter how, uh, how trivial, so that's about a third. That's, that's about what I expected. That, that's, that's great. So, so I'm really addressing the two-thirds of the others of you. Okay? So uh, here we go. Uh, What's Haskell? So Haskell's a purely functional programming language. Um, it's lazy, meaning uh, functions don't evaluate the arguments. It's higher order, meaning functions of first class values. Um, it's strongly typed, like many languages, but Haskell is ever so much more strongly typed than many languages. It really takes it off to an extreme. And it's a general purpose language. It's not primarily a domain specific language, so it's very easy to write domain specific programs in Haskell. So um, uh, why, why might you want to, um, to learn Haskell? Why are you here? So I'm guessing that um, you might be here just out of curiosity, but I hope that you'll go away filled with a little bit of excitement about what, what Haskell stands for. So it's a, functional programming is a kind of radical, what I put in the abstract, is a radical attack on the whole business of writing programs. Uh, the main mainstream object-oriented imperative programming languages are mainly about manipulating state. An object is a container for mutable state, and that's an incredibly powerful programming paradigm. But it isn't the only one, and functional programming languages come from the other end that says programming is about values rather than about mutation. So I sometimes call it value-oriented programming rather than functional programming. So I think value-oriented rather than object-oriented. We'll see that repeatedly during this tutorial. Um, so I hope that by the time you've finished, even if you're not completely persuaded that functional programming is the way of the future, at least you'll go away with some kind of new insight about how to write programs um, from, a, from a rather different perspective. So that's my goal. Okay. So uh, I want to say a tiny bit about Haskell by way of setting the scene. So um, Haskell's really a research programming language. It was designed about 15 years ago by a bunch of uh, rather mad people, um, including myself. And this is the fate of most research languages. Uh, they're designed by one person, they have a user base of one, and they die after a year. Now, a successful research language in the, the academic world does something more like this. Right? It gets 10 users or 100 users. It never gets past the geek uh, uh, vertical axis. Right? It never gets out into uh, real applications here. Uh, and it dies after about five years. Um, now, real languages. Uh, like um, Perl and Py Python and C++ and Java, cross this threshold of immortality, after which there are so many programs written in it that they cannot die. <laughs> so uh, they're just sort of off the scale here. Um, and Haskell has done this rather strange thing. It had, a, after we started building it in 1995, then it went through a, it went through a growth period and, and it was somewhat on the boundary between geeks and practitioners. And then it kind of stabilized for about 10 years. But just in the last... Um, uh, three or four years, there's been a lot more activity about it, which I believe is probably why I'm standing here in the first place. And I just picked a couple of um, quotes 
from uh, some blog entries about Haskell that have showed up in the last year. The one I rather like is that learning Haskell is a great way to train yourself to be ready for C Sharp 3.0. <laughs> That'll do for me, right? Any, anything that works. But I'm betting that once, you, once you've been using Haskell for a while, C Sharp 3.0 will just go by. Now, so I thought rather than starting with, um, uh, with sort of uh, very basic, you know, here's a list and here's how to reverse a list, what I would like to do is to introduce Haskell using as a coat hanger a particular application written in Haskell called Xmonad. It's not written by me at all. It's written by um, uh, Don Stewart and Spencer Jasson and a couple of other people. Uh, it's grown its own little user community now. Um, and it's a window manager. So it's an X window manager. So here, for those of you, probably 80% uh, uh, of you know exactly what a window, window manager did, but I didn't until uh, a couple of months ago. I had to revise my window management. Here's what, here's what they do. So here's X11 sitting in the middle, talking to the mouse, the keyboard, and the screen. And there are various clients, X terminals or clocks or whatever, the programs that are running, that talk to X and, and, and talk to the, um, to say, please, will you display this? And X, meanwhile, talks to the window manager and X sends to the window manager information about what's happening on the screen, mouse events and keyboard, uh, keyboard events and uh, window sort of dragging events. Um, and he gets back from the, the window manager the desired placement of the windows. So the clients don't say where to put the windows, the window manager does. Okay, so that, that, that's his role in life. And so this is the piece that Xmonad is. Is this, is this roughly right? Tell me, so, so, somebody tell me if I'm talking nonsense. So... Uh, so X, why have I chosen this uh, as an example? Well, I, I've chosen it because it's a kind of real example, so I'm hoping that it's a program that you might actually like to write, and it's of manageable size. It's not too big. Uh, it's about 500 lines, this one. Um, and it illustrates lots of interesting techniques. It's an open source piece of software, and it has a little user base all of its own. Uh, it has its own little website and all that good stuff. And it's actively developed at the moment. So there's lots of activity on the Xmonad mailing, mailing list. If you go to xmonad.org, which you can do if you have any quiet cycles, uh, you'll find lots going on. So here is what I mean by uh, manageable size. So these are various um, uh, much better known uh, window managers up the left uh, that are all written in C. Um, and there are somewhat, somewhat uh, large numbers of, of lines of code. Xmonad is deliberately designed to be rather small. It's only 500 lines of code. Um, I can't comment on, on the extent to which Xmonad covers the functionality of all of these things. I'm sure it doesn't cover all of them. But uh, at least it's a lot smaller. And, I think, and it, does, it does a significant, significant job. So I'm just going to show you um, if I can do so with, without seeing um, on the screen what's uh, going on, if I can show you what, um, uh, what Xmonad looks like. So Xmonad is a tiling window manager. Uh, so can people at the back read this? Oh, almost, almost. So I'm sure that control right click or something made me get a bigger font last time, but it doesn't seem to anymore. It puts up shell mode instead. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, good. Uh, so we're not going to do a, a lot on the screen. So what, ha what happens? So what have I got to do? I've got to say, um, N. There we are. So this is... Um, so here I'm not going to run uh, Xmonad as the whole window manager. I'm going to run it a, as a window manager within an X window. This is uh, mediated by a program called Xnest. So this big thing we're seeing on the screen is, is, the, is Xnest's window. And within that is the window manager is what Xmonad's going to do. So I'm going to uh, ask Xmonad to uh, make a um, couple of windows. So these are all X terms that I've made. An X terms model, which you run... Uh, which you'll need to know for the rest of this tutorial, is that it has, uh, it has some, it's a tiling window manager, so it completely fills the screen, and its business is to decide the layout of the windows on the screen. And generally speaking, there's one window which has the focus, that has the red border, so that's where, when you type, stuff's going to go there. And it has one window, in, in the particular layout algorithms that I'm going to show you, always make one window big and the other small. So here's this one big window on the left, and I'll call it the master window. And there's some very smaller ones on the right. So, and if I sit here and say, uh, make a clock, um, then I should get a clock window, right? And, um, and uh, uh, it's rather big. So now I can move the focus around in the usual kind of way. If I, if I click in this, so I'm, I'm now clicking in this window on the right. And what happens? It, it, get, um, it gets the focus here. Okay, so that, that's Xmonad very briefly. And I can do, uh, with various key combinations, you can do the usual th kind of things that you might imagine, like uh, making things bigger and smaller and, uh, and moving around the focus. Okay, so it's just a kind of thing. Of course, the Xmonad isn't really the point of this tutorial. I just want to give you the kind of, kind of stuff that it does. So far, so good? Okay, let's see if I can seamlessly shift back. Yes, I can. Excellent. All right. 
Now, how does XMonad work inside? Well, uh, so it's talking to X11. So it has, being a Haskell program, it talks to the foreign function interface to X11 because XMonad is written in Haskell and X11 is written in C. So it talks to the foreign function interface. And internally what happens is it has a, some kind of state machine which has a, a, a state that it transforms. So it gets, it gets some kind of event in and then it transforms the session state into a new session state guided by uh, configuration data like how wide the borders should be and, and layout algorithms that say how to lay out things on the screen. Okay, so that's the picture. Yes? Absolutely, yes. So, so, what, so what's, good, good question. So what's this state stuff doing here? So, um, so in the end, uh, any program must manipulate state, right? A, a program that, that, that has no side effects whatsoever is a kind of black box, right? You, you press go and it, it runs and, and all you can tell is that something's, you know, the box gets hotter, right? So in the end, in the end programs must do some input output. <laughs> Mm, that's right, a side effect, the box got hotter. So, so somehow we need to find a marriage between um, this purely functional stuff and doing input-output. I'm going to describe how to do that a little later. So hold that question, because there's a whole section about I.O. But it's crucially important, how do we marry up input-output and talking to X and stateful stuff with uh, a program that, does, um, uh, that is value-oriented? So I'm going to show you, I hope. Okay. Uh, right. So, so now I'm going to zoom right in on um, part of this session state. So part, one, one part of the session state is a stack of active windows. So when I showed you those four windows on the screen, um, Xmona has its little model of uh, which is the master window and which, is, which has the focus and all that kind of stuff. So here's, here's my, uh, um, I'm going to zoom right in on the Haskell module that describe, that is, keeps the data structure for that stack of windows. Actually, it's going to be a ring of windows. Now, what have I done with that little pointer thing I had? Oh, thank you very much. Right. But I now unplugged my computer. Ah, good. OK. Good. So here is, so here is some code. I'm going to show you quite a lot of code um, in this tutorial. And I really want you to understand every line of the code that I show you. Right? I'm not just showing you code to impress you. It's because I want you to understand it. So you must, you must yell if I, if I start to go on without showing you what the code actually does. So this is a picture of the stack module. So modules in Haskell start with the keyword module at the top, and they say, here comes a module. This is the name of the module, stack. And this bit after here is the list of things that this module exports. So this all is very conventional. There's a keyword where, and the rest of it is the body of the module. So very like, much like Python or, or, um, or any other uh, straightforward modular language, you can import uh, stuff from other modules. So there it is. There's an import statement. Um, you can define a new, new type. So here's, a, here, here's the first thing we're doing. We're defining the data type of stacks. The, stack, the thing we're modeling here is our ring of windows. I'm going to make this, uh, I call it a stack of windows, but I'm really going to make it a ring in which one window has the focus. And initially, that's also going to be the master window. So in our initial setup, the master window, that is the big one, and the focus window are going to be the same thing. So here is my ring of windows, and the green one is one with the focus. And then I'm going to have this, this module is going to export some functions like uh, insert, which takes a window and, and, a, and a stack. And um, that's, that type signature is completely wrong. It doesn't. It takes a window and a stack and delivers a new stack. Um, uh, and swap here is going to swap the focus between uh, the, green win the green guy, the focus one, and the next one around the ring. It will just swap those two around. Right? Just permute the two and move the focus to the... Um, uh, move the focus essentially to the one that's being swapped into the focus position. So these guys here uh, with double hyphens are comments, and these guys here with double colons are read has type. So this says swap has type. It's a function, so that's the arrow. It takes a stack to a stack. Okay. Now, so already there's something a little unusual going on, which is that swap, uh, if it was an object, would take a stack to unit or void or something, right? But this delivers a new stack. We'll see a lot of that in what comes. Okay. So far, so good for the sort of outer structure. Um, now, uh, it, so this is this window stack stuff. I don't want the operations in this module to be dependent on the particular kind of windows that I'm manipulating. You might imagine that a window is a is a, is really a, a pointer off into C space. It's really an X window uh, X window uh, idea. So it should be that this stack manipulating module doesn't need to know anything about the windows themselves. It's just maintaining which order they're in. So. Um, 
So I've, I've changed this module subtly to say, now, now I'm going to define a data type of stacks of things of type W. Well, I don't know what W is. And so now uh, insert and swap. So swap here takes a stack of Ws to a stack of Ws. And the fact that, uh, that W is here a type variable, the way you should read this is, for all types W, take a stack of W to a stack of W. If you were writing in, um, uh, in Java with generics, it would be stack angle brackets W, close angle brackets, right? So it's, um, uh, you probably come across Java with generics. But the, the, the way to think of this is, for all types W, a stack of Ws to a stack of Ws. Does, does that make sense? Because that's, we're going to do, do a lot of this. Uh, and by making the W just the type variable, I'm saying these functions don't, don't, they don't mess with the W, right? Because there are no useful operations on a type variable in Haskell anyway. So far, so good? Okay, so here's the first build piece of Haskell code. This is the swap function. So uh, uh, here I'm just going to take this function and blow it up big. Here it is. So, and I've also filled out the type definition for stacks. Now, so the way to read this is the type stack, it's a, it's a new name for an existing type, and the existing type is a list. So lists are used a lot in Haskell. They have a lot of special supporting syntax, so I'm going to use lists quite a bit. And so this says a stack of Ws is simply a list of Ws. Square brackets, you pronounce list of. Right? In ML, you'd write W list. Um, in Lisp, it's all built in. In, in, uh, in uh, Java, you'd write list angle brackets W. No, but here, you just write square brackets. OK? And our, our, the comment here is going to say, well, the first element, the first element of this list and the master window is going to be, uh, so the first element of the list will be the focus window and the master window, and then it follows clockwise around the list. Now then, uh, what's this? So swap is going to take the top, the, the focus window and the next one and just swap them so that the, uh, the W2 becomes the focus window and uh, W1 uh, um, becomes the... Uh, uh, you know, the one underneath. So what have I got to do? Well, so, so, I, so I've got three cases to consider, haven't I? Because the first possibility is there might be no windows in the stack at all at the moment. After all, it's a list here, and the list might be empty. And the way in Haskell you write the empty list is by writing open square brackets, close square brackets. All right? So this, there's three equations for swap. And this just said the first equation says swap of the empty list is the empty list. OK, so swap does nothing to a, a stack that only has one element in it. Now, a list can have two forms. Uh, one is, I've written them up here, one is an empty list, and the other is it can be a cons, that is, a cell whose head is a window W and whose tail is another list of windows Ws. So here we are. Uh, the other possibility could be a cons. Um, so uh, here, but we've, got to take, we've still got to take two cases into account because uh, is there a next window after the first one? So it could be W cons and then the empty list, that would be a stack which only had one window in it. And again, swap is the identity function that. It does nothing, right? It delivers just a new stack, W cons empty list. OK? And meanwhile, so now we get to the, the payload is uh, when we get to a, um, a stack whose first element is W and his next element is W2 and the rest of it is Ws, then we return a stack whose first element is W2, whose second element is W1, and the rest of it is Ws. OK? So now this is, this is a good point to pause, because, because we're in, this, this, is, uh, this is sort of classic pro, um, programming 101 uh, uh, definition of a function by cases. So uh, I'm hoping that at that, that this point this seems fairly, fairly straightforward. Is it, but but, but if, it, if it doesn't, this, is, this will be a good time to yell if there's anything obscure here at all. We've only had one. That's, thank you. Uh, you said you use the word cons the whole time. Yes. Uh, I've used the word cons, and, and I am using that of colon, but I don't actually mean concatenation. So if I had two list values, I couldn't put cons between them. Right? I can, so I can put, so let's see, when I have a cons, the thing on the left is an, as the first element of the list, and the thing on the right is the rest of the list. Right? The thing on the left cannot be you know, the first chunk of the list, because otherwise that wouldn't tell you uniquely where to split it, apart from anything else. Whereas this uniquely says peel off the first element. Good question. And I pronounce this colon cons rather than colon, because that's, that's uh, uh, from for long ago historical reasons in the list days. Yes? For your third case, is it OK if WS is an empty set? Yes, it's perfectly all right for this guy to be uh, um, uh, itself to be an empty list. In fact, it will be w if I give it a list with exactly two elements in it. So whenever I'm binding on the left, a variable matches anything at all. right? Uh, cons is map only cons cells. Nil maps only nil. 
or the, the empty list, um, but variables match anything, including the empty list. Thank you. Yes? This one here, excellent. What would happen if we omit that? Right. So, what, what, any any guesses as to what would happen from anybody else? Error. Hmm? Error. So, and, and yes, an, an error would occur because it matches a, 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 a um, list with exactly one element doesn't match the first equation because it's empty because nil doesn't match a cons, but it doesn't match the second equation either because this equation says a list whose first element is 1 and whose tail is a list whose, second, whose first element is w2, right? And if, so this, the, the, uh, if there was a nil here, that wouldn't match this cons. Oh, I, I'm silently expecting you to just read this to remark that the cons brackets to the right. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a multi-position orientation. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So if you leave a case out, you'll get, uh, well, you get a runtime error if you ran it, but the compiler will, in fact, warn you to say there's a missing, uh, missing case in your collection of equations. Um, but sometimes you might know that there cannot be a, a, a single element uh, a, a list with exactly one element in it. That might be excluded you know, by some other higher level knowledge of your program, so it's not actually rejected. You can run the program perfectly well. Okay, we're good? All right, so I want to show you a little bit of syntactic sugar, different, sy syntactically different ways of writing the identical program because uh, uh, Haskell has lots of superficial syntactic sugar. It has quite a lot of uh, sugar that conceals a single simple underlying reality, uh, but it's worth seeing some of the sugar just in case I should accidentally use it, and we'll come across more as we go along. So here up in the top right-hand corner is the definition I wrote just before, and here is a... Um, a definition, what's the difference here? It's, it's outlined in red. Instead of saying w cons empty list here, I've written uh, square brackets w uh, on both the left and the right. And why can I do that? Well, it's because the, um, I think this was on the previous slide, here, uh, you can, in Haskell you can write a list. If you write, if you write the list open square brackets a comma b comma c, that's short for the, um, the list uh, a cons b cons c cons uh, nil. So the square bracket notation is um, just short for a list. So, so square brackets X, open square brackets X, close square brackets, like here, is short for W cons nil. It's just syntactic sugar for that. So it means precisely what this does. Okay? So that's that. The second thing you may notice is that here, the, two, the first two equations, the left-hand side and the right-hand side are the same. It's a no-op, right? We don't do anything to a stack of, that has no elements or a stack that has one element. So you might think, couldn't we just deal with the case that we care about and then have a catch-all case for the rest? And that's exactly what I'm doing here. So you can just have the case that you care about first, and then, just as we were remarking earlier, this guy, this W, will match any argument at all. right? And so pattern matching is done top to bottom. And if, if the argument matches the first pattern, it'll, we'll take the first right-hand side. And otherwise, we'll, we'll, it'll, we'll try the next equation. And this will match any pattern. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, and the last thing we can do is we could put all the pattern matching on the right-hand side. So rather than doing pattern matching by uh, writing multiple equations, we can say swap of any argument w's is, and now here's a case expression. So it says scrutinize w's and look at the following cases. Right? So this is just this, this same uh, definition here written out as a case expression on the right-hand side. Right? All of these things mean exactly the same thing. They translate into exactly the same thing when the compiler's had its, had its way with them, as it were. Yes? Is that going to also be matched top to bottom? It absolutely is going to be matched top to bottom. Yes, thank, uh, thank you very much. It, it's, um, and so we could indeed have done just the same. We could have taken this, this one and, and done it here as well. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Oh, no, you. <laughs> Sorry, what, what's your name? I'm Bob. Bob, hello, Bob. Yes. Since W can be null, yes. aren't you okay with Where? Here? Yes. W's can be null. That is, oh, 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 null in the, in the Java sense. No, no, no. No, W's cannot be null in the Java sense. So in Java or C Sharp, you can, if you have a list, you can have, um, uh, uh, you, so pointers could be null pointers, meaning they don't point to anything. Every data type in Java and C Sharp has the possibility of being a, a, a null alternative. That doesn't exist in Haskell, right? So in Haskell, there are no null pointer exceptions. It is not possible to get one, a null pointer exception, because there are no null pointers. 
If you want null, you have to write it by saying, you know, I'm an empty list. So I really am, a, as it were, a pointer to an empty list. There, you know, there go a huge class of errors. This is, this is not a specific functional programming sort of thing. But, you know, you could do this in Java or C Sharp. It's just the sort of historical and cultural heritage has led them not to do it, which I think is a, technically a mistake. But nevertheless, there we are. Um, but it, I mean, it's easy to fix in a, type, in a typing way. It's nothing to do with side effects or the absence thereof. It's just the type system issue. But there you go. So in Haskell, we, there's definitely the choice. There are no null pointers. And there's no is null test. So if you've got a W's, it's definitely uh, either nil or cons. It is not nil or cons or null. Yeah. Oh, the empty list. Oh, good question. So if you had a list that only contained three, it's a list of integers. If you have a list that contains the character x, it's a list of characters. If you have the empty list, what type is that? It's a list of, well, it's a list of any old type. So it actually has the type, so nil has the type for all types A, list of A. So, and, and that's a bit like here when we said, this says there's a silent for all types W, stack of W to stack of W is the type of swap. And the type of nil is for all types A, list of A. There's no arrow in its type, but it still has the for all types part of it. So it's a polymorphic value. Very useful things, polymorphic values. Yes, you had a question. On um, the case, on the next slide, the case expression, is that what allows you to do um, like a where expression for local variable in the pattern? Oh, that? Uh, the question was, do, does a case exp is a case expression what allows you to do a where clause? So you can, so, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll show a few where clauses later. But yes, yes, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's somewhat stylistic which of these you choose. Haskell provides lots of different syntactic forms because sometimes one is more convenient than the other. It's hard to be very hard and fast about it. Yes? Go back to the previous slide. Um, on the bottom right, is that, am I to read that as precedence or just as um, the bracket? You're just to read it as precedence. It means this in exactly the same sense that A times A divided by B divided by C means A divided by B divided by C. I was hoping there'd be a whiteboard here, and V promised me a whiteboard, but there isn't. Um, so uh, you shouldn't really think of this recursive. If I, as recursion, if I said A minus B minus C, right, then that's just ambiguous, isn't it? Do I mean A minus B minus C, or do I mean A minus B minus C? There's nothing recursive about minus, right? So it's exactly the same sense in which you should think of this as bracketing to the right. It's just that this brackets more tightly. Now, it happens that the tail of a list is itself a list, Right, so there is something recursive going on, right? But that's the, the bracketing is just in the sense of operator precedence. It's a right associative operator. There was another question over over here. Yeah. yeah it was just around. Um, so there are different there are different ways of writing your code. Do you run into differences in performance, or is the are the they compiled? No, these will all compile into the same machine code. So the yeah. Three yeah. Three yeah. Three of course, you know, I can't. I, so I'm the author of this compiler, so I can't promise that it will all, you'll always get the best, uh, uh, the best thing every day. But um, these will definitely all give you the same answer. Yeah. Um, so it's a sort of software engineering issue. OK. So now, so now we're ready to run this program. Right? So we've got this little stack module. We might like to test it or run it. So um, uh, you can, you can, um, there are lots of Haskell implementations. One of them is uh, GHC. That's the compiler that... Uh, um, myself and, and uh, Simon Marlow and various other people are responsible for. And uh, Hugs is another well-known uh, Haskell implementation. And there are several others like JHC and YHC. They're all available at Haskell.org. And so you can, uh, you can uh, download them and run them anytime. They're all open software, incidentally, uh, BSD licensed. Um, now, uh, you can also run them interactively. So Hugs is just an interactive interpreter. JHC is a batch compiler, but it's also an interactive interpreter. You call it GHCI then. Um, and when used as a compiler, you just use it like CC. You say GHC-C stack.hs, and you get stack.o, and then you can uh, link those. So I'm just going to just thought I'd just uh, show you running um, GHCI on uh, stack.hs. So uh, what do we do? Oh, crumbs! A screensaver. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, so what have I got to do? I got to. I'll kill this. Right. So. Um, so I'm going to run st stack one is the stack module that I've been showing you so far. Uh, 
and so here we are. So what can we do? So GHCI is a little interpreter, very much like the you know, Python interpreter or Perl interpreter or something. And you can, it's just, it, it gives you a little um, if, uh, redeval uh, print loop prompt. And you can, type, uh, you can type little expressions, and it'll evaluate them for you, as you might express, expect. And, um, uh, uh, and you, you, it's, sort of, it's just a little expression evaluator, really. Um, you can, so you can, uh, and you can, you can type lists as well. So uh, what do we say? And the list uh, reverse, the list uh, one, two, three. Uh, so we talked about lists being um, a collection of cons cells. And then you can load. So the syntax in, in GHC and hugs for loading a module is colon L. Uh, so here we are. We can load um, stack.hs, and then we can say, uh, so the stack, stack one defines a, a, a value called empty, which is the empty stack. Uh, oh, you got a parse error. Oh, so I did. What did I do? Darn. Oh. Oh, now I'm going to have to debug programs online. How exciting. <laughs> what, what line was it? 48. 48. What have I done here? I haven't a clue. I can't even see here. Something about indentation. Oh, I missed the comment. Kicking my plug again. Oh. Oh, happy days. Good. Uh, so empty is one of the exports of this stack module. It's the empty stack. And then I can um, insert, uh, uh, what's the uh, type signature of insert? So insert takes a, a window and a stack and gives you a new stack. This is a, a Mr. Um, so here's the, here's, the, uh, here's the type of insert. It takes a window and a stack and gives you a, a new stack. What's this EK thing? I'm going to tell you about that in a short while, but not just yet. So um, if I insert uh, three into the empty stack, I get a stack with three in it. And if I was to say uh, swap, uh, what, what's it called? Was it called swap? Uh, swap next, I think, yes. I, I abbreviated on the, on the slide. Swap next of uh, oh three empty. Uh, then it's a no-op, of course, right? So it gets get a bit tiresome, tiresome um, typing uh, uh, re expressions repeatedly. So you can use let notation to bind a new name. So I'll just bind s one to insert uh, three into um, insert uh, four into empty. So now to make myself a nice uh, little stack, yes, very good. And now if I say now if I say swap next, S1, uh, I should. So all this uh, just exactly what you'd expect. You get a little uh, little interpreter that lets you uh, mess about with the functions you just defined. So even before you built a big uh, whole uh, whole program, you can you can start right away um, uh, uh, trying your functions out. Okay, so far, yes. Oh, yes, you have. Yes. Have you seen any functional programming? <coughs> sure. So, well, so, so uh, actually, have I, have I uh, no, I've, um, uh, I have to say something a little bit about that in a second. So all of these things are functions in the sense that they have no side effects, right? You haven't seen an assignment anywhere yet, right? I haven't said x becomes x plus 1. I haven't mutated the stack. I've simply produced a new stack as a result. So in a way, this is good news, right? Because it suggests that I've slipped functional programming um, into your brain without you really noticing that it was anything very weird. And indeed, functional programming simply is something that we do when we're writing Java or Perl programs all the time. It's the world of expressions, right? So, so the uh, imperative language is divided into the world of expressions and the world of commands. An expression is something you evaluate, is a command is something you perform. And the, the outer structure of an imperative program is do this, do this, do this. It's a sequence of commands, right? And, but within each command are expressions. In a functional program, all you have is the expression part. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, so we're just going to um, uh, we're going to carry on and do a li little bit of um, uh, a little bit more uh, uh, introduce a bit more of a sort of our Haskell inch notation uh, while we're here. Where are we? So we're going to um, focus next. What does focus next to do? Um, it's going to move the focus one click around the ring. And what does that mean? What happens to the window that's, that's fallen off? What happens to the current focus window? Well, it goes on the, the back end, right? 
Um, so since I'm representing my, uh, my, uh, uh, my ring as a list here, I have to stick it on the back end by appending here. What am I doing? This plus plus. Now this is list append. You were saying is, is, is the thing that glues two lists together is uh, append, and it's written like this with two pluses. So it's just a, um, another function. And uh, here I'm appending the singleton list uh, w on the end. But of course I must take care of the case when, they, when there's nothing in the window. So now, uh, what, does this, what does this function do? This is the first time we've... Um, I've paid much attention to a function with more than one argument. So this is plus plus is not a piece of built-in syntax. Haskell allows you to, to define infix operators. And this is how you give the type signature of an infix operator, by putting it in parentheses, right? You say brackets plus plus. That's just a way of saying, here come. This is, a, this is a, uh, the operator plus plus treated as a, as a normal name. We wrap it in brackets. So it has type, takes a list of A, and a list of A, and delivers a list of A. So there's two lots of arrows here which is, may seem a bit puzzling. So in, a, in another language, you might expect to see list of A, sort of bracket list of A, comma list of A, arrow list of A, with a single arrow, right? Because this, the way to think of this is that this function takes two arguments, so it's a bit puzzling that it has two arrows in it. Yeah? So if it took, you know, three uh, arguments and returned two, would it be, you know, arrow, 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 and then... And then a pair, yes. If it took three and returned two, by returning two would mean you really would return a pair as a data structure, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, I, when, I, when I looked at that, I, my first thought is, well, how does it know which arrow means what is returned? Right, so it's always the, the thing at the right-hand corner is, is what's returned. But actually, um, so, so uh, just before explaining the arrows, let, let me make sure that we understand what append does, right? So append just does just what you'd expect to list. The list one, two, appended, and append onto that the list four, five, you get the list one, two, four, five, okay? So now, the way to think about this arrow, so one, one way is you can just look at it through half-closed eyes, and you can take, take it on trust that this just means a function that takes two arguments, right? And this is the result out of the corner here. But the, the, the kosher way to think of it is to, uh, is to um, know that arrow brackets to the right. So this really means list of A, arrow, open bracket, list of A to list of A, close bracket. So it's the same thing we were talking about precedence with cons. The precedence for arrow is also right associative. So what does that mean? That means append is a function of one argument. It takes a list and delivers what as its result? A function that takes one argument and delivers a list. Does that make sense? No. Should I say that again? No. All right, so put, imagine brackets here. Sorry, I'm, I'm lacking my whiteboard, I, and I don't want to write on the screen. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll imagine brackets here and here, right? So append is a function that takes a list and delivers as its result, it takes a sorry, it's a function of one argument that takes a list here, and delivers as its result a function. So append applied to just one, two, is a function which puts one, two on the front of its argument list. It's a closure, that's right. It delivers as its result, it's a function of one argument which delivers as its result a closure, a function closure, which when applied to another argument will stick the first on the front of the second. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, yes. Uh, uh, yep. Shoot. Sure. Okay. Uh, that, that's invisible to in, in most. I mean, you can't pass the. the it's an anonymous function, right? It, it is an anonymous function. You can, in fact, put, so, so it's not invisible in the sense that in Haskell it's perfectly okay to apply append to only one argument. Here, I've applied it to two, but it's possible to apply it to only one and get as a result a function. Um, so it really does have this bracketed type. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to sort of uh, make too much of a meal of this because I'm not going to make much use of this, this uh, technique which is called currying. I just want to, to kind of, rather than just saying, here's some magic, trust me, I'd like to kind of explain a little bit that there, re there really is some underlying logic to why two arrows mean a function of two arguments. How yeah? How can you define a function that's not in fix? That's not in fix? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, so if I just wrote foo, colon, colon, yeah. uh, and gave it this type, then foo would be a function of two arguments. We're going to see some of them. Uh, no, that's right. So, so for functions which are not operators, that are not written in fix, you go function argument rather than uh, uh, argument. For, so that the function is written prefix rather than infix, yes. That's right. The reason it's in fix is that we know it's in fix because it's formed out of operator symbols rather than formed out of names, rather than formed out of alphabetic characters. Yes. Thanks. Good point. Okay? 
So let's define append. So append, as I say, is not built in. This is just a library function. And here it is. So now, coming back to your question again about recursion, we really do have recursion. Right, but here's the definition of append. When I'm writing the definition, I'm allowed to write inf the infix operator on the left-hand side as well as, as well as the right-hand side. So here's the definition of append written with two equations. So this says the append of the empty list, that's the first argument, and a list called y's. If you put uh, the empty list on front of y's, you just get y's. And if the, uh, the first list has an x at the front, is x con something, well, the result is x con something, and the something is the append of the x and the y's. Okay? So this is just, just ordinary old recursion. But of course, since functional programming languages don't have assignment, they can't write for loops that mutate variables and change their values. Recursion is the only way we can perform iteration. Yes? I'm curious whether your compiler knows the function definition done when the gates are all exhausted, or is there some sort of... Oh, how, you, oh so... so well, it's, I'm not sure whether you, you could be asking two things. Does the compiler know that this defines all the cases for append? Well, you answered that already. Yeah, right. And the second question is, will this definition terminate? Right. right. Sadly, that means answering that question means solving the halting problem. <laughs> right, so it's tricky. Uh, and, and GHC makes, makes no attempts to do so. so. So no, you write your function. If you write f of x equals f of x, GHC will simply make your computer get very hot. <laughs> You're on your own for termination. That said, um, if you want to write a termination checker, you've got a lot more, uh, you've got a lot more headway when you're starting in a functional setting. I want to say a little bit about how you might think of about evaluation, because the thing about imperative languages is that their execution model is very close to the machine itself. Right? We know that the underlying machine has registers and assignments and loads and stores. And in functional programming language, we don't have that same, ex same sort of visceral execution model in mind. So I'd like to give you an execution model. Um, and, and here it is. It's very simple, just rewriting. So how do I take, uh, how do I imagine the computer evaluating 1, 2 plus 4, 5? Well, first of all, just desugar it. That is, remove these square brackets, which are just syntactic sugar. So 1, 2 is just 1 cons 2 cons nil, and 4, 5 is 4 cons 5 cons nil, right? Now imagine that plus plus here, this, this thing that I've underlined matches the second equation with x bound to 1, x is bound to 2 cons empty list, and y is bound to the rest, right? So I just rewrite this to get this, and now this bit matches the bottom equation again, and I can rewrite that. So the way to imagine execution taking place, this isn't exactly what happens, but a good way, a faithful way to imagine it taking place is by successively rewriting expressions. Okay. Yeah. Indeed. Isn't it, isn't it inefficient? Appending the, the, these lists takes time proportional to the length of the first list. And you might think, oh, but, uh, but in any decent language, I could, I could go to the tail of the first list and just update it to point to the second list, right? Well, so you still have to march down the first list to find the end of it. Right? So maybe, but you don't have to allocate. Maybe you have a pointer to the end of it, right? So, so indeed, um, uh, indeed, there are lots of tricks available to imperative uh, programming languages that aren't directly available to functional ones. Very often you can get amortized time that's exactly the same. The other big thing to notice, though, is if you do splat the end of the first list, you haven't got the first list anymore. It's gone away. Right? So, uh, so if some other part of your program thought it had the first list, now it's been mutated. It's become a different list. And therein lies a source of many, many bugs in many programs, right, is that a value you thought you had has been mutated by somebody else that you neither knew, knew nor cared about. So functional programming languages come from this end that says it's a very, very sort of rigorous position. I don't want to say that it's the only position you can take or even necessarily the best position for everything. But at least you know where you stand. Things don't change. If it's the list one, two, it will be the one, list one, two until the end of time. It will not get splattered at the end. And, and that's not cost free, but... Um, after all, computers just have to be fast enough. Right? And, um, yes? What happens to intermediary loops? Oh, these little, uh, so there's a great deal of garbage collection is going on in, in the part. So, so if you really rewrote this, which early interpreters did, then you get a lot of allocation of intermediate stuff, right? Good compilers these days just go straight to the answer, right? They don't allocate the intermediate stuff. But the business is that they're meant to give the result as if they had done all, all this rewriting. Okay, so uh, let's see, what did I want to say? I wanted to, say, um, I wanted to just, just uh, show another couple of functions before uh, wrapping up this little section. Where are we? Yeah. Uh, focus pre, focus on the previous one, says move 
uh, one stage in the other direction. And I've chosen to do this perhaps in a slightly odd way, which is to take the list, reverse it, and then uh, call focus next on it and reverse it again. So this is a very inefficient uh, way to uh, do focus pre, but it, it, you get a lot of code reuse out of it. And if you're just writing a quick window manager, I mean, after all, in a window manager, are you really worried about how long it's going to take to reverse the list of windows? Right? And you've only got 10 on your screen. Probably not. Right? And computers are there to save programmers time. And, uh, so, and, and uh, in this case, it won't keep the user waiting. So, uh, so it, it also serves to illustrate my purpose, so I, which, uh, which is to um, show you a function somebody asked about functions in prefix form. So reverse is an ordinary function, also defined in the library. And it's, so here's its type. It takes a list to a list. It's defined by recursion in much the same way. There is a more efficient way to write it than this, but it'll do. This says to reverse a list whose first element is x and the rest of which is x's. Reverse x's and append on x to the end. We can do it. That's a, this is a very expensive algorithm. You could do it more efficiently. But I wanted to make a syntactic point, which is that when we're writing function application for, for functions that are written in prefix form, we don't write reverse open brackets x, close brackets. We write reverse space x. As if by magic, a whiteboard has appeared. How wonderful. Oh, look. What joy. Thank you. Um, so function application is so important in functional programming languages that we, we express it by saying nothing at all. <laughs> right? The most valuable character in the ASCII character set is space, right? the quietest character. And so we use that one for function application. No brackets. So this means reverse applied to x's. Furthermore, function application binds more tightly than anything else. So this means reverse of x is appended to the singleton list of x, right? So you could put the brackets. It's perfectly OK to put the brackets. But just remember that function application is the most tightly binding. Um, over here would be great. The most tightly binding operator. OK, so are we OK with syntax for this slide? Let's do a bit of uh, higher order programming then. So here at the top is the, uh, the function we've written already. Yes? I meant, I should have said parentheses, yes. When you said before, uh, for your plus plus example, you had brackets because you had a points to a points to a, and you said it would have been the same if you surrounded the second uh, set of a's. Oh. Uh, this one? No, no. No? Yes, that would have been a round a, a parenthesis. Thank you. Sorry. Parenthesis, yes. Round parenthesis. The square brackets mean list of, and round parentheses just mean grouping in the, in the usual way that they do in mathematics. Thanks. Very, very useful point. I'll try to remember to say parenthesis without stumbling over my words. <clears throat> OK. So here we are. This is, this is focus prev, again, written by three functions. And what does it do? Well, it takes w's, it feeds it through reverse, it feeds it through focus next, and then feeds the result through uh, uh, reverse again. And we can also write that like this. This, is, this here is function composition. A mathematician would say that uh, focus prev was the composition of three functions. Right? You, you, uh, um, uh, you compose uh, focus next with reverse, and you compose that with Reverse. In mathematics, you write it with a little ring. You write um, f ring g to mean uh, f composed with g. And so in, in, in Haskell, it's just a, a, a rather quiet little dot here. That's function composition. And here is its definition. Uh, th this dot is not built into the language. This is, it's simply an operator like plus plus. So it's one of the operator symbols. And here is its entire definition. This is all that the compiler knows about dot. It, the, the dot it's, and it says uh, f dot g applied to an argument x is f applied to g applied to x. So here, focus.reverse applied to an argument w's would be focus next of reverse of w's. Does that make sense? So, I'm, so there's nothing. Uh, I'm really using this. I, it, it, it's, I'm not saying this is a better way to write uh, focus prev because um, uh, this is pretty clear as well. But sometimes you can find, sometimes this dot, dot composition, dot notation is quite helpful to say, here is pass one, followed by pass two, followed by pass three, followed by pass four, and just dot them all together. It can, be, can work really nicely. Yes? In the top form, you have W's explicit. Yes, that's right. In the second form, there's no W's. Absolutely, yes. So does it uh, just apply to whatever you plot? 
So that's, that, that, that's, that, that's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing it up because I've, forgot, I've forgotten to mention it. Yes, so, so here, the focus brief is a function, right? So the left-hand side, this focus brief, so I'm defining a function. So I can say this uh, focus brief is equal to, but then I would have to give a functional value on the right-hand side. So this right-hand side must be a function. And indeed, just, you know, if f is a function and g is a function, then f composed with g is a function, right? So, uh, so I could have said, I mean, I, I could, supposing I said focus brief equals focus next, perhaps that's a good way to start. I mean, that isn't what we want focus brief to mean. But if we'd said focus prev is equal to focus next, that would be a perfectly good definition of it. I don't have, just because it has an arrow in its type doesn't mean it needs an argument in its definition, right? All I have to make sure is that this focus prev thing gets as its right-hand side uh, a value which has the right, which, which is a function, as focus next indeed is. Does that make sense? So, so, here's, so, so long as the right-hand side is a functional type, that's okay. So is this right-hand side a function? Well, it's the composition of three functions like this. Yeah. Yes. No, you should not think of this as an alias, right? It's more like um, it's more like if you, in, in mathematics, you, you, you might you might have if you had x in, in scope somewhere, you might say you know let uh, y uh, be x plus seven, right? And then you could say all right, so that means that y simply is x plus seven in everything that follows. You can say this in Haskell too. But if you just said, let y be x um, in verbal, then you could think of y as an alias for x. But it's not an alias in the sense of, oh, uh, you know, if I assign to x, I'll assign to y. It's just that x and y are simply names for the same value. Yeah? Uh, and just when you did the uh, definition of that from zero, you don't do type signature. Aha! It'll be preferred, right? Here it is. Good. So I, because the type signature is a little scary, you see. So I was hoping to sort of uh, just get you. The definition looks quite innocuous. And the type signature is bigger than the definition. So, but, but you're getting good at this. So this will give you no trouble at all now. So what's dot? So dot is a function that takes two arguments, f and g here, right? And gives as its result a function. Right? So its two arguments are this f has type b to c. This is for all types a, b, and c. It takes a function from b to c, that's f here, a function from a to b, that's g here, um, and give us, as a result, uh, the function from a to c, right? It sort of uh, goes all the way from a through b through uh, thing and gets to c, right? Or you, but, but remember, this, the, these parentheses at the right here are redundant. Remember, that's the uh, grouping thing. So you could equally well think of con uh, compose as a function of three arguments, a function, a function, and a value of type a that gives a value of type c. They're, they're just, you can think of it either way, whichever makes you happy. Um, is, is good. Okay, yeah. Uh, oh, you don't need this one. Oh, do you mean, do you mean here? No, that makes it interesting. Right, yes, that's right. Uh, you do need this one because if I didn't put bracket, I, did, I didn't put parentheses here, it would mean if I wrote something like dot has type B, arrow, C, arrow, A, arrow, B, arrow. Then it would mean a function of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You see what I mean? So by putting brackets like this, parentheses like this, that, uh, absolutely. It's like saying you know, A minus B minus C is not the same as yeah. So there were those, those, these ones are essential, and the ones at the end are not essential. They're just there to give you the idea of taking two functions, producing a function. OK? So yes. That's right, I don't, yes. Right, right. So if you, if you were to just try applying focus prev, you could take this very definition, you could try applying it to a list one, two, three, or something, and you could just, just keep replacing definitions by their, at every, at every moment you replace and so at the occurrence of focus prev, you would, you would replace focus prev by its right-hand side. And then you would replace dot by its right-hand side and so forth. You just keep doing replacement of left-hand side by right-hand side. But if the left-hand side is a simple variable, then you just replace the variable by its value. It's like saying, let x equal 7 in something. Well, whenever you see x, you just replace it by 7. And that applies to the functional values too. So the name of the game is that functional values are completely first class. I'm not going to make a big deal about that in this, in this tutorial. I just thought this was a good moment to... Uh, to uh, wave that particular flag. It, it makes it very simple and uniform. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, could I eliminate the Ws from here? Well, it would be a bit it would be a bit difficult, wouldn't it? So because I've got to I need something to put in the corner here. Right? I need a sort of placeholder. So what I, I could do, I wasn't gonna uh, mention this for later, but you could say focus prev equals lambda written backslash w's arrow, and then you could say what is it? Reverse of focus next of reverse of w's. Right, so that all I've done really is I've moved the argument from the left to the right. But it reminds us again, this, is, this means this lambda expression, which is showing up in it's, uh, Python has lambda expressions and C-sharp 3.0 has lambda expressions. Uh, this is just a first-class function, meaning that function, which when given an argument w's, sometimes called closures, right? That function or closure, which when given an argument w's, returns reverse of focus next of reverse of w's. But that's the only, that, uh, apart from that, I don't, I don't think you could eliminate it without going to this kind of form. All right. Very good. So what have we got to? So now we've, um, uh, what have we done? I've, I mean, we've, um, uh, we've written quite a bunch of functions about all this, and now we might want to, um, uh, want to test them. So I thought I'd switch from doing functional programming to showing you a bit about testing, uh, because functions are particularly easy to test. Uh, so here's what you might do. Uh, let's see, we focus, we've written functions uh, for swap and focus next and so forth. And you can write, um, uh, you might like to write down some things that you believe to be true. Right? What do we believe to be true? Let's think of some of them. Well, here is uh, something we believe to be true, that if we, say, if we take an S, a stack S, and we do focus prev on it, and then we do focus next on that, we should get back that this is equals equals, meaning equality, right? equality of data values should be the same as S. You believe me? Right? We click the, the, the loop around one and we click it back, we should get the same answer. And so I've, I've encoded that here as a function, uh, as a function in Haskell. What does it do? It takes a stack, uh, a window stack, and returns a Boolean, which is true if focus pre, but focus next, if the stack is equal to the stack. Right? And I've given, here I've introduced the new type TS for test stack, which is just a stack of integers. It's more difficult to test stacks that were of, of unknown type. So I'm just, but since, since the, the uh, stack module doesn't know what type of things it manipulates, it suffices to test it on stacks of integers. If it works on stacks of integers, it'll work on stacks of windows. So and I call it prop underscore. Uh, that's just my convention. That means uh, it's a property. Does that make sense? So this is something we would like to be. This is a function that we hope would always return true, no matter what argument we give it. So it's not a very useful function to run, but it might be quite a useful function to test. And swap, we would like to be self undoing. Yeah. When, when, it's, when you say equals equals S, do you, is it like a, a deep comparison? Yes, it's a deep comparison. Yes. So you're going to look right through the values and check that they're, check they're equal. It's not pointer equality, it's structural equality all the way down. Yeah. OK, so here are some properties we'd like to be true. So how can we test them? Well, we use a tool called QuickCheck. Now, QuickCheck is, is a, um, it's just a Haskell library. It's not a, a sort of source code um, analysis tool. It's just a library that you can import. So here we are in GHCI. I'll show you this in a second. We can, um, we can say GHCI is stack.hs, and we can, uh, what is this? This colon M says, bring into scope all of the functions from uh, test.quickcheck. So it's rather like a, an import statement for the, uh, the redevelop print loop. And then we can say QuickCheck of prop underscore swap. So quick check is a function exported by this library. And what does this function do? It takes prop underscore swap, which is a uh, function. So it takes this value, prop underscore swap, as an argument, and it tests it. And it tests it by making up random values and trying to see that they all, that making up random values, applying prop swap to them, and seeing that they all give the answer true. Right? And then we might say uh, quick check a prop, prop underscore focus NP. That's this guy. Uh, and you make up random, random values here um, and uh, see whether he passes uh, 100 tests, right? And the interesting thing is you can use the very same function. These are functions that take one argument, but you might think, so how does it make up the values? How does, it e how does QuickCheck even know how to make up values of type stack? Because QuickCheck is a library that was built in the complete ignorance of the very existence of stacks. So uh, the answer is in the type. So QuickCheck has a rather strange type like this. It takes a uh, it has a double arrow in it. So it takes a prop, uh, which actually will turn out to be one of these things, 
and give something of type IO unit, which I'm about to get onto, and, but the prop must be a testable thing. So it takes testable things somehow. You should read this as for all testable types prop, take prop and test it and print, a, print an answer. So I'm going to show you in a bit more de detail later how that works. But meanwhile, I'll just uh, do a little, um, uh, do the, uh, just show, show you how this uh, plays out in practice. Now what happens? Uh, uh, Oh, hang on. I've actually got two, um, two stack implementations, and I've only shown you the first one. Can that work all right? Yes. Uh, whoops. Uh, Drat. What did I do? Two U's. Ah, did that work? Quick check. Oh, I haven't shown you the, uh, excellent. So here's stack.hs, and here, so here's the, uh, what, so stack.hs imports stack1, which is the module we've been looking at, um, and then has that little piece of code that I showed you with these, um, uh, with these test functions in it. So the, uh, the testing methodology is you define functions that give Boolean results, and then you run quick check on them. Uh, and that, now, this is only a testing thing. It's not verification. It just tests um, uh, with random test data. I'm sorry, a quick question about the, the, the definition for the, the TS, where it says, you know, type TS yes. is stack in. Yes, um, here. Okay, if you had, you know, if your stack had things which the same, would you do a stack thing which did the same thing? Oh. Like, how does, it, how does it go down that list and, and know where it's going? Like, how does it know I'm doing a stack in as opposed to, Oh, right. So, good question. You I mean, how does QuickCheck know that? Because it has to make up things, doesn't it? Yes. How does QuickCheck get to know that it's manipulating a stack of int rather than a stack of uh, something else, lists or something, lists of ints or stack of strings? Right, right. And how, how would you define some other, some other type like that? So oh, you, so you could, you could certainly find, you know, type, uh, uh, other kind of stack. It could be a stack of booleans or a stack of strings or a stack of stack of lists, uh, or a stack of stack of int. That would be... And, that's right. These are, this is just any, you can put any type here. So it's a stack of anything, including, I mean, I can't think of why, immediately why one might want a stack of stacks in this application. But you certainly could write that. Right. And then QuickCheck would certainly test it in exactly the, exactly the same way. So it is a bit mysterious how QuickCheck manages to, to do this without really being told very much at all, except the name of the function, or rather the value of the function that it's testing. Um, and I'm going to show you how that happens a little later. It's just a little teaser. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just want to show you one, one other thing, which is that uh, uh, because it can be uh, tiresome to sit in GHCI and type um, and to run these tests one after the other, what people often do is, is write a little script um, which runs over the source file, finds all the functions which, which start prop underscore, and makes a, little, um, makes a little GHCI script and then feeds that to GHCI. So in other words, does everything that I just did manually, only does it automatically. So uh, uh, here's what you might do. So uh, let's get out of GHCI here. And so what am I going to do? Run Haskell, qc dot. Uh, so run Haskell says, um, what's going on here? Run Haskell is something that says that my first argument, it's rather like sure. It says my first argument is a Haskell program. I would like you to compile and run it. So it's like using Haskell as a scripting language. So this is, the, this is the, uh, the program that we are running. So run Haskell just says, run this Haskell program. This Haskell program QC, which I'm going to show you, calls over its arguments. I've only written one argument here, stack.hs. Gobbles up the uh, code inside them, finds all the things called prop underscore, generates a little program to give to GHCI, runs GHCI and feeds it to it. And this is the output from doing all of that. Okay. So it's just a convention, that's right. And it's a, it's, but, it, but it's used by most quick checkers is to call it prop underscore, yes. OK. So I'm going to, I'm, the reason I, uh, I showed you that is um, partly just because that's what they do, in fact, and also because in, in about uh, half an hour's time, or after, after the break probably, I'm going to show you, I'm going to go use this script as an example of scripting in Haskell and doing input-output. But so far, we've only been doing purely functional programming. OK. Now, I want to stand back just a little bit. Um, 
Will you return it to your question of have we done any functional programming? If you're happy, we've done some function, functions now. You've seen some functions at least. Uh, so just, just to sort of stand back and see what, what, what's, uh, you know, are there any differences about what we've been doing and what we do in normal programming? So the first thing to do is to say that there really aren't any side effects. We've never, we have not written an assignment in any of this stuff. Um, and the, when we call swap here, we get back a completely new stack. The input stack is totally unaffected. Uh, so, in, and that's useful when testing here because when we called prop underscore swap, we swapped it twice and then we compared with the input. So it was really very important that the input wasn't screwed up, right? Because if the calling swap had screwed with the input, then we couldn't really have, we'd have to take a copy of the input before we could compare it. Um, so another way to think of it is that uh, ne variable names stand for values and not for locations, right? In uh, C or, or, or Java, the, the variables tend to stand for locations that can be mutated. Here, they just stand for values. So my favorite analogy is just, it's like spreadsheet programming. In a spreadsheet, you say the value of this cell is the sum of those other two cells. The spreadsheet works out the dependency chain. And, 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 and the value of a cell doesn't change with time. It simply has a value, right? Unless you do funny recursive things with spreadsheets, which is very naughty and not encouraged. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so the spreadsheet model is a good, good one for thinking about functional programming. The, um, uh, this purity about not writing side effects means that the uh, type makes the interface completely explicit, right? So uh, what you know here is that uh, this swap really doesn't do anything to anything except it takes a stack and it produces a stack, and that really is everything to know about swap. You, need, you might need to know what is the kind of stack that it returns, but you, it can't do anything else. So... We might write in C an imperative function here, void, uh, void swap, that takes a stack and diddles it. But you don't know that it doesn't also keep do some persistent state or write to the disk or do, or do lots of other things behind the scene. Void means uh, I'm doing something, but I'm not really telling you what. Right? Uh, so as it were, Haskell functions wear their types on their sleeve, and, and C functions wear them a bit behind the scenes. And you need to be pretty disciplined when you're writing. Uh, programs in imperative languages to be explicit about what other effects you might have. Um, and I've already slightly mentioned, mentioned this, that this purity does make functions easier to test. Right? Because they wear everything on their sleeve, uh, if you want to set up a test, all you've got to do is produce some input values, apply the function and look at the output values, and the input values are all still available. In contrast, in a, in a stateful world, you have to set up the state of the world so that your desired function under test can then see an environment around it that's what it's expecting. Then you, as it were, press the button, the function executes, and then you look at the world around it to see that it has been mutated in the expected fashion. So don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not bad-mouthing imperative programming here. It's really a wonderful way, you know, it's a ter terribly powerful and effective way to write programs. Um, but, uh, but it's very, very different to the way in which functional programmers think about it. Yes? So by looking at functions, you can even know that it has an I.O. side effect? Yes, by looking at a function, you can know that it does not have an I.O. side effect. I'm going to tell you very shortly uh, how you can tell if a function does have an I.O. side effect. But at the moment, these ones cannot um, have, uh, have I.O. side effects, or indeed side effects of any kind. They are pure. <laughs> yes? No. So, so, so if you, you could run this stacky, stacky stuff, if you had enough, um, oh, well, think spreadsheets again, right? Can you evaluate a spreadsheet in parallel? Of course you can, right? So if the data dependencies permit it, you can evaluate, you know, two cells that depend on chains of cells in parallel because the computation model is inherently deterministic and parallel. Functional programming languages are exactly like that, yes. So it's not until you get to side effects, which, as we shall see, we, we, we will allow in in a, in a disciplined kind of way. Then you need synchronization. Until then, you don't need synchronization, except in the implementation, which has to be a bit careful, just as a parallel imp implementation of Excel would have to be careful to make sure that when you did the two evaluations, you synchronized at the end. Yeah, but that's not a side effect. What is uh, so under the hood, of course, there are zillions of side effects going on. Right? So the implementation, in effect, you know, I'm sitting there under the covers doing side effects like crazy, but I'm making it uh, so beautiful for you that you, you can then give pure thoughts, <laughs> and I will do the dirty deeds for you. Yes? So there's a function that uses garbage collection, but then you function return, because I know I use and I get rid of 
so certainly all functional language implementations have a garbage collector, and it's just like the, the sort of Java or Lisp or C Sharp world. You don't garbage, we don't garbage collect just when a function returns. We just wait till we run out of store and then garbage collect. It's usually not very clear exactly when you've let go of the last pointer to something, unfortunately, because this can lead to some uncertainty about how much space your program consumes at any moment, which is a weakness. Uh, but there you go. So yes, it's very important to be backed by a good garbage collector. Okay? Ah, good, we have uh, 10 to 3. So uh, what else do we want to notice about here? Oh, last thing to notice is types. So types, types are everywhere, right? This is, this is strongly typed uh, programming. I'm not going to give you the, uh, the sort of usual rant about static versus dynamic typing, uh, sort of, and because uh, reasonable people can differ on this point. All I want to point out for you here is that this is a very statically typed language. Um, nevertheless, let me just mention that it is possible to do dynamic typing in this statically typed context. You can make, by pairing up a type, a value, with its type representation, you can build sort of secure dynamic types as well. But I'm not going to have time to do that in this tutorial. But the point I really wanted to make, standing back from this, is that types express a kind of high-level design. People sometimes say to me, do you have UML for Haskell? And I think guilty thoughts. I think maybe we should have UML. I want, but I only think that for a very short time. I think that types are our UML. And that when you're designing a Haskell program, what you spend your time doing, this applies to many other functional languages, that incidentally, like ML. When you design your program, you spend time writing types and writing data type definitions. And those, that is the kind of UML-ish level of design with the additional merit that it's executable. And it forms part of your final program and never gets out of date. The other remark I should make about types is that almost all of them can be inferred. I've been writing type signatures pretty vigorously, but you can leave them all out almost without exception, until you get to the more advanced type system features. You can just leave the type signatures out, and the system will infer them for you. So it, leaves it, it, it becomes a sort of free software engineering choice for you about how liberally you wish to decorate your program with types. OK. So any questions? Oh, yes, so if you've left out your type signature and you're wondering what the type is, you can load it up into GHCI and say, I didn't show you that. You can say colon T and the name and an expression. It'll compute the type of the expression and print it for you. Yes. Um, so you can ask. And then you can paste that back into your program if you want. People sometimes do that. All right, so very quickly before we, we have a break uh, at about three, I wanted to say... Um, to uh, do a little bit about improving, improving the design. I want to have a slightly different design of the stack that allows me to introduce a few more features that we haven't discussed yet. So, um, so far, in, the, in the, uh, the, um, uh, the setup that I've shown you, when you uh, move the focus, the, uh, to, to do, when you do a swap, a new window comes to the front. Um, and that means that that big window, uh, or how, how to say it, the big window on the left is always the one with the focus. So if I focus, if I click in another window, that window moves to, to be the big window. So when you click, the windows shift, which is very confusing, right? So it's not a very good design for the window manager to have. So what you probably want to do is to be able to click in a window and have, it, have the focus stay there without moving the windows. If you want to move the windows around, you want to do something else, right? So, um, uh, so what we want to do is to have a slightly different design that looks, uh, looks like this. So, here, so now we want the window, instead of being a ring of windows, to be a sequence of windows in which the first one is going to be the master window and someone in the middle is the focus window where your typing um, goes into. So it's the one we want to pay attention to. Um, and I'm going to choose to represent it by um, a pair of lists now. So I'll represent the, uh, this sequence here by two lists. This is a pretty arbitrary choice. Right? You can represent this in lots of ways, but this one gives me the chance to introduce data types. Uh, so two lists, the, the stuff from C onwards is the second list, that's this list of W's here, and the stuff to the left is this list of W's. So now I need to pair, how am I going to represent a pair? So I'm going to do that with a data type declaration. So now this says, this introduces a fresh data type stack, stack of W is, well, and here's what's called a data constructor, so it's very exactly like a constructor in Java or C Sharp, it builds values of the stack type. So a value of stack type is always a full form MOOC stack of uh, list of windows. Cons and nil are both constructors of the list type. Um, and in this uh, data structure, uh, these guys, I'm going to keep these guys reversed. So in effect, it's as if the, the focus window is the place we're looking, and the rest of the data structure sort of just droops down away from it. Right? So the, the focus window is at the head, then there's the, uh, 
the, uh, the windows beyond it droop away, and the ones on its left are kind of reversed so that, the, so that C, B is at the front of the list on the left. That's just a design choice. It's not the only design choice you could make, but I made that choice, and I've documented it here. So I say the left, the left is reversed, and I'm going to have an invariant that if this list is empty, right, so there is no focus window, then the whole stack is empty, and so this guy better be empty too. That will be my invariant. Okay? And so now, uh, once I've got this new data type, I can uh, define um, what was, our, was my first example, enumerate. So enumerate is the thing that takes the stack and delivers a list of windows in display order, starting with the master window. Um, and so uh, enumerate takes a stack and delivers a list of windows. And what does it do? It takes a MOOC stack of L's and R's. So, oh dear, I've changed the spelling. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, this, is, this is, read that as MOOC stack of L's and R's, what have I got to do? In order to make them in display order, I've got to reverse L's and append on R's. So we've seen that before. Now then, uh, what do we want to do if we move focus? Well, um, uh, let's see. This is focus on the previous window. So that means I want to move the focus to the one, one click to the left. Right? How do I move the focus one click to the left? So I want to pick up this guy. Well, this guy is conveniently, because it's reversed, at the head of... Uh, the list of guys to the left. So here it is, right? Um, uh, the head of the list of guys to the left. And um, uh, so if, uh, if there's one there, well, I'm in good shape, right? I can um, just do a, I can un, so this is just pattern matching. I take it apart on the left-hand side, and I can do nested pattern matching, notice here. So this is a MOOC stack with a nested pattern inside it for the, uh, the cons of the list on the left. And then I just uh, build a MOOC stack with the new focus window, being the focus window on the right. Okay? And if the one on the left is empty, then, ooh, ooh, what have I got to do then? Does that, does that mean I can't move to the left anymore? Well, no, because this focus thing is meant to be a ring-like affair, right? So I've got to somehow sort of um, uh, go around. If I, the, the, I mean, there is a choice here. We could say, once you got to the beginning, you can't, if you go left, you don't go left anymore. But if we want to keep moving, right, by, by moving the focus now to the right round to the end window, which is what we had before when we had a ring, we're going to have to do something different. Uh, so what do we do? Well, um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. There we are. Uh, so what have I got to do? I've got to somehow, um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, have I, did I get this right? So uh, this doesn't look right, does it? This doesn't look right at all. Anybody think this code is correct? Uh, doesn't look right to me. So if, this, if the guy on the left is um, empty, then uh, a good plan might be to... Um, uh, oh, suddenly, I've, I've, you, know, you know that? You know what happens when you're standing in front of a lot of people and suddenly your brain doesn't work very well anymore? Um, but it's not... Sounds like it's time for a break. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> oh, it's five to three. It's time for a break. <laughs> Yes. Uh, actually, that is a really good plan. <laughs> why, why don't we have a break for... Uh, so, 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 in fact, um, I got this... We have plenty, plenty more stuff. So, should we come back? It's now five to three. Would quarter past three be good? Is that long enough? Okay, 3.15. And by then, I'll have figured out whether this, this code is correct. 